Hey everyone, my name is Sean Oster, and you all are here to learn about creating great UI in XAML. Um, thanks for coming to the session, I really appreciate it. I know a five o'clock session is sort of odd, but I just walked here from my hotel, and you do not want to be outside right now. The, <laughs> the traffic was horrible. So you're a nice, air-conditioned, calm place. So we'll keep it nice and calm and educational. So like I said, I'm uh, Sean Oster, I'm a senior program manager on Windows Phone in the developer division, um, specifically in the control stack, you know, helping bring really great controls and ways to work with controls to developers like, your guys, like yourselves. Now, I sort of made an assumption there. Who here are developers? Nice, my people. Um, <laughs> um, and who here has used AML before versus not? That was a horrible question. <laughs> who here has used AML before? Oh, good, good, good. So the way I'm going to run the session is it's a little different than ones I've done before, if any of you have seen me. I'm not going to go just dryly through each control and teach you how to use it. I'm going to try to present you with new information that you've never seen about controls and new ways to use them. So how am I going to do that? Um, one is I'm going to talk about why you should care about good UI. Why does that matter for you as a developer? Uh, then I'm going to take all these great lofty design ideals and teach you how to translate them from design ideals to actual code. Um, the biggest thing I always get frustrated by is I know my app doesn't look good. Some designer wanders by my monitor and says, that doesn't look very good, and they wander away. And I'm like, I, what do I do with it from here? I don't know. Um, and then after that, I'm going to give you lots of little details. So I'm going to give you a little checklist that you can run through your app if you're sitting there and you don't have time to refactor 2,000 lines of code, but you want to you know, check a few screens sort of a checklist you can run through. So why does good UI matter? Well, the very first thing is this slide you're staring at right here. Does this inspire confidence or professionalism in you? <laughs> Do you feel like you're getting your money's worth by the guy who rolls up here with this type of slide? And the answer to that should be no. This is a lot better. It looks like you've actually been presented to you by a professional. And this is why good UI, this is one of the reasons good UI really matters in your application. It gives a sense of professionalism. It doesn't just mean that it works. People look at it and go, ooh, that's, that's great. I, I like this. Someone who knows what they're doing created this. So if you still need some convincing, because I used to work with a developer who really did not care how anything looked. He's like, does it crash? I'm like, no. He's like, ship it. I'm done. And so <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm going to try to help convince you that there's something beyond just shipping it. So there's an ever-growing number of apps in the store. That's a good thing, right? More apps. We all like apps. Um, but that means you now have to stand out from the crowd. And it's not enough just to have the first of some kind of app out there. You have to distinguish yourself. Um, and usually that's done through a good UI, a good flow, and of course, it doesn't crash. That leads to higher reviews. Um, I've seen lots of reviews, and some of them are like one star, works great, I don't like how it looks. I didn't want to shame anyone by copying and pasting them here, but I've seen enough of them. Of course, the equals more downloads. More downloads plus higher ratings. You entered the virtuous cycle where people review it and love your stuff. The more that happens, the more we may feature your app in the store, and then that just bumps your whole cycle right back up again. And all of that really equals more of whatever currency you trade in. Um, I know some developers here are from brands, um, and they give away their apps for free. But if you deliver an app that doesn't look polished, then you're degrading your brand. Um, also, obviously, if you get more of your app out there, um, higher ad impressions if you're using ads, um, if you're in a try-to-buy model, Obviously, people will start reviewing it higher. And if you're in, in that, that rare category of just try, like, our app is so cool, you don't even get to try it first. And there are some, and they're really good. The only thing people are, are judging you on are your reviews and those five or six screenshots in the store. And so again, that's why design really matters and really matters to nail it. So even before I get into code, I know we all want code. I see the number of developers out here. Um, before you get there, whoa, cowboy. <laughs> I'm sure you guys have heard the term a cowboy coder. Um, I was a dev for 14 years, and I would be on the bus, and I'd get a really cool idea, and I would run right to my computer and just start coding. I got this cool object model, and I have a great way to put all this together. I got these two screens knocked out, and somewhere around 3 in the morning, I realized, oh, wow, 
I actually need to duplicate this code over here. I need to redo this. So before you begin, create a sitemap. I know it's basic. Um, it's been with us ever since web pages and before installing apps, but really pays off to create, just to grab a piece of paper, sketch it out real fast in 10 minutes, and just think about how users will flow through it. Not just how, you, how users will flow through it, but how they will get there. Will they dump into some pages from a, a live tile? Will they be coming in from a, a protocol that some other app is calling them? It's important to think of sort of the basic structure of how your app will flow, because that lets you pick sort of the, the tools you need and the controls you need to build it. Sort of like when you pack to come here, you didn't throw your whole wardrobe in your suitcase before you left. Though I saw a few people do that, and we won't comment on that. But um, <laughs> um, so yes, create a, a sitemap. And then think about what your home page will be. That's the key first impression for a lot of people. Um, one of the questions we always get is, when should I use a panorama? So here's Hulu using a panorama. Uh, think of a panorama as a magazine cover. It's not a, it's not a, a cockpit dashboard where you can do everything from this one place. Um, panorama already is such a rich control that it takes up a lot of memory. It takes up a lot of perf. The more you jam into it, the slower it's going to get. Uh, you really want a high level, like magazine cover type of experience where you, know, you can see something and then drill into it on another page of, say, like all the episodes, or you can drill in and see all the clips of a season. Um, this makes it fast and performant, and it keeps it the sort of visually arresting type of, of experience. Pivot, that's the uh, counterpart to Pano. A pivot is a way to have a filtered view on a single set of data. For example, restaurants. There's a lot of great restaurants here um, that I hope to get to. And there's some that are close by, and there's some that are expensive, some that are cheap, and those are different categories, but off the same data set you can filter. Another way you can use Pivot is a single concept, like a person, like your profile. And then each profile has different sort of verticals in that. Um, all your contacts, um, all your photos, all your websites. So that's, that's where Pivot comes in as a powerhouse. Or if you have a design vision, go for it. You can forget all about anything else you see and create something. Um, this is an app called Rando. And you just take a picture, and it goes somewhere on the internet. And no one, you don't know where it went, and no one can comment on it. And one comes back your way. It's sort of a cool app, and it's a very different UI. But it works. It works for their app. And again, while we're leading up to the actual code here, um, adopt the design language. I'll do my counterparts over in the other competing mobile platforms a favor here and say, when you develop for them, also adopt their language. Uh, because the, the system has some metaphors already in place that people know how to use. And one of the largest markets that we're moving into are people that haven't had a smartphone. So they don't have this built up set of experiences with other competing platforms or any set of experiences with um, other experiences, other things. And so you really want to build on what they already know. If they grab the phone, use the app bar, use the system tray, um, you know, use press and hold for a context menu, those things on a Windows phone you want to reiterate in your application. But that said, you don't have to lock in. Again, this is sort of that magical middle ground of push and pull. Um, here we have a, a pivot, but we're using this full bleed image. It's a custom pivot. Um, the next app over is this great app called Counters, just to count things. As you can see, I was building this deck seven days ago. That's my countdown to build. Um, it's a very simple UI, but it's completely custom. And then next we have um, this other app called PhotoPlay. It's like a photo sharing app. And everything is very you know, Windows Phone design centric, except for they've overridden um, the different accent colors to use their own sort of teal branding color versus using the system accent color. So these are all different ways that you can um, use the standard things on the phone, yet tweak them if you have needs for like branding or for ways to just stretch your legs. OK, I promise that's enough of the, the lofty design ideals. We'll actually give you some hard data here. So we're actually going to build something. Um, I sort of doodled this little application called uh, Pincushion, which is a, just a read-only Pinterest client. And that worked great up to two days ago when the back-end API changed. But we won't talk about that. <laughs> we will focus on the, the, the UI portion of it. Um, we're just going to show this is a pretty standard looking Windows Phone app. And even these type of apps, we see time and time again apps in the marketplace missing just little things that could maybe give users that impression of a higher level of quality.
before we get started on any app, you probably want to go grab um, the Windows Phone Toolkit. Who here has used the toolkit? OK. For those that don't know, uh, so when we're planning each release of Windows Phone, we look at our list of controls. We look at everything we want to ship. Like, what can we put in the SDK? In the SDK, which ships you know, in these long, sh longer ship cycles. And then we look at things that developers can and can't do. Um, developers can write custom controls that work really well. You guys can't dig into our input thread and change how we handle gestures to make input scrolling super smooth. So we focus on doing the things that we can do that you guys can't, and which means some of the things like standard controls end up getting pushed into different ship vehicles. Um, so these controls and a lot more are in the Windows Phone Toolkit. Um, we have a message box. We have a context menu so you can recreate that press and hold experience, um, a date picker. Um, list picker, which is like a combo box for those that don't know the, the Windows Phone vernacular, uh, an autocomplete box, and a toggle switch. All these controls are there and more. Um, there's also motion in there. So before you begin, you'll probably end up needing a lot of these controls. And if you scratch your head and go, where are these? Head on over to NuGet and grab it. Um, if you haven't used NuGet, I highly recommend it, both as a consumer and a publisher. I love it. We actually dropped the whole MSI support for Toolkit in favor of NuGet because it makes managing versions and updating so much easier. Um, like, so like I say, it rounds out your control selection. Um, it also adds page and control animations, which we'll cover a little bit later. And those are key in, as part of the design. Um, there's then a bunch of extra helpers, things that work with the visual tree, if you know what that is, um, date time converters to convert a date into something more human friendly, like three minutes ago or two days ago, which is actually pretty easy code to write, but it's a lot of boring code to write. And why, why do it when someone else has already done it for you? And we have those in the toolkit as well. Layout. Layout is the, right as you're building your pages, how are you going to lay out your app? First, don't be afraid of white space. Um, we see a lot of apps, they're trying to cram everything in. Don't be scared of you having some white space in between your controls. So layout. This is an actual a red line from our design studio. And they talk about different things that you need to do to your app. So like I said, don't feel like you have to cram information into your page, into above the fold, as they say in the newspaper industry, that part of the newspaper that's above the fold. And then they think that everything underneath it, no one reads. Not so on a phone. Vertical scrolling is the most natural gesture to do on a phone, besides dropping it, which I do quite frequently. Uh, um, so you want to support vertical scrolling in your applications. Once you do that and you stop cramming your stuff in, you can now adhere to the, the standard 24 pixels from the side. So when you're designing your app, you want everything to be pushed at least 24 pixels over from the left and the right edge. Unless it's like a photo where you want full bleed, but 24 pixels in. Um, and also, as you're laying things out, you want enough space between your controls. Um, you want at least a 12 pixel margin around everything that's tappable or touchable. These 12 pixels, um, they sort of map to a a hit testing to make sure that you know even my chunky fingers when I'm on a bus or staggering home, I can actually tap on the controls without hitting something else. Um, all our controls by default have this 12 pixel moat around there, but if you're writing your own or you're overwriting, make sure you keep that in place. Um, it's really important to the usability of the phone. And now that you have vertical scrolling in your apps, support both portrait and landscape. Um, I know one of my favorite phones was the Nokia 800. It was very compact, very small, and I loved it. But of course, I love my 920 as well, but it's a much bigger phone. I find myself turning it landscape a lot more for reading articles, for you know, browsing sort of con you know, rich content. So if you can, have your apps support landscape as well. And I'll show you how to do all these things. Um, if you guys have been to Karina's talk, she's uh, talked about the design grid, so I won't hit it up too much here. but. It's an image, an overlay that we ship in all the projects. You can turn it on, and you can see if your controls are lining up to this grid. This is the same type of grid that the design studio uses when laying out all the first party applications. I mean, it's a good way to say, like, something looks off. I know, I know that, that Sean guy said something about white space, and I'm trying to do this design stuff he told me about, but everything looks crammed or too far apart. Um, if you align things on this grid or use it as a rough guide, you'll find your layout actually does magically look more professional. I'm not kidding. I laid it over some stuff. I resized some things. I'm like, wow, I, I might actually buy this app now. 
So here's Foursquare. And there's something about this design that just works. It looks well, you know. But if I was doing it, what numbers would I use? How would I guess? Well, when you lay the design grid over it, you can see it roughly matches up. You can see how things actually fit. And, and so you end up getting that nice visual polish. Now, I don't know if they used it or not. I bet they did. Uh, but you can see things that align to it end up actually having sort of a clean interface look to it. Styles. Before we get to the code, I have to teach you a little bit about styles. Um, who here knows about styles already? OK, let's, I, I'll give you guys a quick overview. Um, style, if you've used HTML, it's like CSS in a way. It's just a collection of commonly used properties, um, say a foreground color and an opacity and maybe a font name. And these three things you want to apply again and again and again to multiple different controls. Um, stop doing that. That'll <laughs> drive you insane. You can just create a style, and then you can reuse the style. Uh, styles, you can store them globally in your application. Um, you can do it just at the page level if you don't want to pollute your, your namespace with a bunch of styles. Um, you can also take those styles and m m put them at the control level. Not that you ever really want to, but you can. Um, another good thing is a bunch of standard styles actually ship in the SDK. Do people know about the standard styles that ship in the SDK? Do you guys use them? I don't see any hands. I see a nod, though. I'll take the nod. Yes. Um, so, yes, a lot of people don't know we actually ship a bunch of standard styles out of the box, so I can show them to you. And as you can see, the format for a style is very easy. You just say, it's a style, and you give it a name, and then you have to say what, it, what it's targeting, what type of control it's targeting, like a text box or a button. Um, and then styles can also inherit from other styles. So you can build up a nice hierarchy of styles and say, well, I have a default, and that default is built upon. Use pixels. We have very few pixels, so be, be wise with your pixels. Um, two things um, that I want to enforce and that our design studio wanted me to make sure I talked about um, is this upper area here. Um, one, unless you have a very, very good reason, please don't turn off the system tray. I don't know how many times you guys have been in an app and you go to swipe the top down to bring the system tray to go, oh, I wonder what time it is, or am I low on battery? And you can't because the application is turned off the system tray. Um, now, some things like, video, like games and full bleed images, do turn it off, and that's, that, that's understandable. But unless there's some other reason you have, turn it on, because it'll make your app that much more useful. Also, after the first page, you can stop using app title for the page title, and you can instead use something more useful, like a profile name or a status. I know it's sort of Microsoft's, um, it's a misconception that we put out there, because when you do file new project, that thing at the very top where it says Blind Panda actually says app title. <laughs> and so the very first thing you want to do is put your app there. Sweet, I did what the guidance said. Um, but once you get off your main page, start putting things like profile name or a current action you're taking. It again, makes everything easier and you're using your pixels wisely. Ha ha ha, finally some code. So let's code some layouts, let's take some of these things and apply them to an application that's not working so well and show you how quickly you can do it. So, can everyone see the code okay? Looks like it. We'll run the app and I'll show you some of the problems we first have. So, one of the first things I talked about was um, the system tray, and I realized I didn't mention it, but there's a bug in our system tray. And I'll show it to you one more time, because you probably missed it. Actually, did anyone see what the bug was? I'd be surprised. So here I'm going to add a name. Now notice up here I'm in the light theme, and the system tray appears light. I bring up this message box. I'm going to add you know, the name of someone that I'm following. I really like monkeys, and so therefore Simeon Jones. And I click Add. And notice how it's disappeared in solid black. There is a bug that when you ask for the system tray background color, regardless of theme, it will always tell you it's black. It's like, ha ha, it's black. What do you think about that? And which is great most of the time because you're not often tweaking it. But the problem is things like custom message boxes or add-on third-party libraries that interact with the system tray, the model is they'll cache the value, they'll change it to like gray like we do for this message box here. 
and we turn it gray. And then, because they're good citizens, they restore it to whatever they got before. Well, they got black, and so it turns black, and you lose, lose your system tray. So I'll show you a quick way to work around that. So I need to clean my project so we can get back to an empty list. So we're going to go over to the user view as soon as the thing builds. Maybe while it's that doing that, I can show you. So here's, I can show you one of the problems we're going to fix. If you can see this text is hanging off the left here, we see that all over the place. Um, and that's an easy thing to fix, and I'm going to show you how to do it. Um, all you have to do is apply one of the styles that we ship, or you can just apply 12 pixels to the left, and it'll scoot it right over. But if you th see things misalign, uh, please go and fix those. Not that anyone here is doing it. I'm not accusing anyone, but... <laughs> so, let's go back over here. So one of the things I was talking about was vertical scrolling. I want to make sure that that root page can actually scroll. So that root page is actually in this grid. Well, the grid doesn't scroll, doesn't provide automatic scrolling, so I'm going to just collapse it. I'm going to wrap the whole thing in a scroll viewer. Excuse me? That's, uh, so when I talked about you should provide vertical scrolling, as you can see, I can't move this up and down, which isn't a big deal. If I rotate it, though, one, I'm not supporting landscape, so it didn't rotate with me. And two, even if it did, you would see it would get cut off. And since it would get cut off, you need a way to scroll that content. So that's why it's good to always have a scroll viewer, which is our sort of scrolling container, somewhere at the root of your application. Now, if the bulk of your content comes from a list, then that already has a scroll bar built into it. But if it's static content like this, go ahead and add a scroll viewer into it. So the w simplest way to do that is you can see I've just added a scroll viewer around the grid, and that will make it start to scroll. And another thing is once you've started scrolling, once, let's run that. Once you've started scrolling things, you'll find an interesting effect, which is it clips right at the bottom. It ends right underneath the app bar, which, let's add our name in again. Click it, rotate it. No, we still don't have uh, landscape, but we do have scrolling, which is really nice. But you'll find that one thing when you start adding scrolling is content can get clipped at the very bottom by the application bar, or it can sit right on top of it, which ends up visually not making your content be separate from the application bar. So the design guidelines are always add 95 pixels of padding between the end of your list content and the application bar. This brings content up into sort of the visual two-thirds portion of the screen um, and just makes it so you can separate that content away from the application bar. These are little things that I don't know if we've ever even published anywhere, um, but they really do make your application feel better. So now we've got scrolling. Let's make sure we can support landscape. It's easy enough to say supported orientations. Well, we want to move it from portrait over to portrait and landscape. We can run it. See how that goes. And then, very nice. Now we support it. As you can see, now we're clipped, and we definitely need to have something where we can scroll up into the content. But this content is right here at the bottom. It's stuck. Like it, it, it just, it's hard to see. It doesn't really, you can't, you have to sort of scoot it up there to see if there's anything else underneath there. So we can do is simply take this grid at the very end, on, we'll just add 95 pixels. And now we've increased the amount of space it takes up inside the scroll viewer. So when I run it again, you'll be able to actually slide it up way past that application bar. And the content will now be separate. So the next thing I want to address is this text right here. This is annoying because it sort of sticks out. So one of the ways we're going to do that is we'll go into Blend, because Blend actually has great support for showing you all the default system styles. So here we have the description text. And all I have to do is right click, come over here to edit style, apply resource, and voila. These are all the styles that we ship with. Um, 
I just want a normal style. Nothing too fancy. You can see it instantly scooted the text over. And as soon as I did that, now it'll come correctly line up on the left side. So that's all well and good, but you don't want to have to do that for every single text block in your application. Um, a neat sort of trick to make it so you don't have to worry about this in the future is you can actually go into your application.xaml. Um, if you don't know what application.xaml is, that's like the global repository of all things that everything your application can see. So come over here to app.xaml. Go into resources. I already have a nice little resource for us. Paste it on in. And what I've done is I've said, this style now applies to every single text block in my application. If you haven't styled it with anything else, it automatically gets um, text box normal style or text normal style. So now everything will lay out correctly and it'll look, even if you forget, you're covered. So now that I've done that, I can actually go back into my user view. I can find wherever that text was, which should be right here if I can click on it. Or not. Oh, there it is. And since I did this in blend, I have to make sure that I save it. It'll reload. And now I can just kill this style right here. And it'll still be aligned correctly. So that's a great way to, to generalize this type of concept. So wouldn't it be great if we could do that with some of the other things, like supporting orientation? Well, we can. We can actually create a style that applies to the page itself. So I'll come back over here to the app, to the app.xaml, grab my little code snippet down here, and grab all of that. So this style here is just called default page style. I want, to, I want all my pages to pick it up. Its target type is phone application frame page. Um, and I'm setting support orientation to be portrait or landscape. And also, I'm setting the background like I was talking about earlier. Just make sure your system tray background is correctly styled. And so that if anything like a message box overrides it, it won't kill the, the color. So we can run it, show it in action. Oop. Bring it back around. So show the message box. Hit back. Ah, it still is broken. Why is that? Because you actually have to go over to each page and apply the actual style to it. So if you go to the home view, which that screen is, we're going to apply a style here, just like you'd apply it for anything else. Static resource, and then we say default page style. Now I can run it. And then click this, hit back, and you have a normal looking system tray. So again, these are, and the page supports orientation still, and this is a great way to take and drive consistency through our application. Because nothing is worse than polishing nine of your screens but missing the last one. And there's that one screen that ends up looking like it just wasn't finished. So now that we have that in place, let's go back over to app.xaml. So we have support orientations, and we have that. Make sure it didn't miss anything. Nope, we're good. So those are some layout tips and tricks. Um, actually, one thing I, I can still show you is the grid, which I wanted to show. The, using the grid is very easy. You just come over here. At the very bottom, when you go File New Project, it'll only be in the root page. Um, if you say File New and add another page to your project, it won't be in there. So I have to copy and paste it, but it's only in that very first page. We can select it, Control K U to uncomment it. And now you can see we have this red grid overlaying everything. And it even persists when I run the application. Um, but it's a great, again, you can see that I have text aligned on boundaries here. I have things at, at, at intervals that, I don't know if you can see that any better. 
there we go. Sorry for having to stare at my face all day. But um, so yeah, you can see that this, this square is aligned to this grid here. Again, and then um, we have my text over here. It's separated by the right amount of padding. So this is a great tool both for Windows Phone and Windows also has a grid similar to this as well that you can use. So if you're designing applications for both. So those are different layout techniques. So now that you have some layout tips and tricks underneath your belt, um, layout doesn't, is only half of the story on Windows Phone. The other half is motion. Uh, motion is a key part of how we interact with the system. Um, it adds that extra little bit of polish and flair that makes it feel like a real first class type of uh, mobile operating system. So for apps, there's really um, three or four different main types of animation you're, you're going to concern yourself with. Now, it's, it's XAML, it's C-sharp. You can do any animation you want. We have a very powerful animation engine. There's whole hour, two-hour talks on that. But you just want to write an app and get it out there and start making some money. So the first piece of motion is the turn style. Um, turn style is when you're moving from page to page. It's often when you're changing context, like from one person to another or from one app to another. Um, and this motion is actually built into the toolkit. And I'll show you how to hook that up to your pages. Um, you don't want to have to go through and redefine all these different animations and all the different you know, va va variables and the way it works. Another popular animation is the slide animation. Um, say you're at the end of your, it's someone's contact card, and you want to edit it. When you hit the edit button, you're not actually navigating away. You're not going to someone else. You're staying on that person. You're just editing it. So an animation to give people a contextual clue that you're not going anywhere, you're still interacting with the original thing, is to slide the UI up. So when you slide it up, it says, hey, I'm still there, but I just slid something over it, and then I, you can edit it, and then I'll slide back down when I'm done. Swivel. If you're creating something like a message box, like we keep seeing and when I add the name, um, that's when you want to add the swivel. You know, imagine you have a square, a rectangle, and you have something that spins and you're stuck to the middle, and you can just sort of make it spin around and around. That's the swivel. Um, so if you're writing a message box or something that only partially obscures the UI, that's when you want to use that one. And all these are page animations and, you know, big animations. Oh, I seem to have lost one of them. There's another animation that doesn't have a slide here, but um, it's the tilt animation. And all you have to do is pull out your phone to see it. Anytime you tap on any control, it sort of bends in a little bit. Um, and everything that you interact with does this. That gives the user an indication that this is about to go do something. It's going to launch a page. It's going to take an action. It's going to delete something or add something. Um, and controls by default don't have this tilt animation built into them. Um, so you can get this tilt animation inside of the toolkit. And I'll show you how to hook that up. So first thing and it is the easiest thing, tilt. We want tilt to be everywhere. The easiest way to do it is to add it into one of these default page styles. Um, if you don't do it, you can do the same thing on a per page basis, but really you want tilt everywhere. It's just sort of something you should have. So an easy way to do that, I'll just grab my little snippet. And now, just by doing that, tilt works everywhere. Everything that uses the default page style, all the controls automatically get tilt inside of them. Um, you can turn it on on per control basis or per page or your whole application. So that's nice, but how about the different page to page? Well, here we have a default page. But what we can do is create another style that supports the turn style animation itself. And so what we can do is create another style that inherits from this one using the based on keyword. So we'll just grab this whole style here and paste it in. And the way page transitions work is you define the animation for the page when you come into it, and you navigate back out of it, and you also define the animation for when you leave it going forward to something, and when you come back into the page from having from that forward navigation. So there's actually really four different animations that you can define. But the system is pretty standard, so you can just copy and paste this, and then apply it to your pages, and then you have the default animations. So to use it, it's pretty easy. We just grab the turnstile transition or the turn, turn style transition page style, go to say our user view, and let's just look at it before we actually add the animation so you can see the difference. 
comment that back out. Give it another run. And it's just a straight, when I click on my name, it's just a straight, flat jump. Sort of jarring. Um, it doesn't have that smooth beauty that you see in the first party applications. So we want to get that same type of animation. Come over here to, we'll add a style. Our turn style transition. And of course by doing this I also now get us the ability to have, um, to have um, the tilt animation included everywhere. And since this is already part of the style, we can just delete that. Run it again. Wait for it. Now when I click on it, you're going to see this nice turnstile animation. Oh, wait. There we go. It's sort of subtle, and the emulator is a little different than a phone, but hopefully you guys can see the actual animation as it turned in and out. And so Animation is a key part of your application. And I'm, again, you can be like, oh, I think I'm done. Go through all your pages, add the appropriate animations. Um, it just makes it seem that much more polished. I, originally, I wasn't going to add them into any things I did. It's like, wow, it really does add that next level of, of sort of professionalism. So that is for motion. So controls. Controls is really the meat of the fun. You know, those are the basic building blocks for your applications. Almost every application out there has a list in it. And our core list um, control is called a long list selector. Now, I've talked about this control over and over in many conferences. Um, so I'm not going to go super deep on everything you can do with this control. Um, but it's a very powerful control. It provides super smooth animations, um, very fast um, flicking and scrolling. It supports the ability to group um, categories together, like you see in the People Hub. Um, it supports a, a bunch of things. And there's actually a great blog post that just came out that you should go read, definitely about learning how to use lists. It's all about the long list selector and how to use it in XAML and how to hook everything up. There's a lot of code there. Um, but one thing that's not in there, that's another bit of UI that you know, I see people not doing that's a, sort of fun to hook up, and you really should do it, is that empty list shouldn't be empty. Um, if you walk up to, a, like you saw in my application, that list was empty. You didn't really know what to do with it. You just saw, OK, I guess, do I wait? Do I tap on something? Um, it's always nice to give people a friendly message that, hey, something you should do something to populate this list. Um, there's actually a standard for that as well, a standard font, a standard size. Um, and I'll show you how to hook those up. as soon as we can find Visual Studio. So let's go over to our home view. You know, there's no empty text right there. So one of the easiest way to do it is we can just add a text block right here that has our text, you know, whatever we want to say. And we don't need Excel, do we? I know it's a PM sort of where they live a lot is Excel, but we don't need it in there. Um, so yeah, we can come over here and we can um, grab this. And we'll just add a very simple text block. I'll even get that out of there. So now we have some text. We have a little bit of a message there. But again, it's not very bold. It's sort of scrawny and doesn't really fill it out. Um, so the first thing we can do is apply the right style to it. Go to blend, because that's an easy place to find all our styles. Um, this is the home view. We can click on it. Right click, edit style, apply resource. Well, hmm, what's a good fit? Maybe empty list header style. Hey, already it looks better. You know, you're starting to you know, create an application that looks professional. So that's great, but if you run this application, do you know the first problem you're going to run into? OK, I know everyone's tired. Uh, the, the problem is you'll see both the text and the list at the same time. I'm not turning it, I'm not hiding it, I'm not making it invisible. Uh, it's all your great work to make something look really nice and professional goes down the drain when they start, you know, overwriting each other. So what, when you actually have content in the list itself, you want to hide the text. Um, there's various ways you can do it. Um, you can just, whenever you, the user makes that call to add something, you can run a function that says, hey, turn, turn that off. 
Um, the way I'm going to show you, the way I like, is you actually hook into the collection that holds whatever you've bound your UI to. And when that changes, then you ask it, hey, is there something actually in you? If there is, then I'll turn off this text. So I'll show you a quick way to do that. So who here is using MVVM in their, in their apps? Good. MVVM is really the way to go. And every, everything, the way this is structured, is very MVVM based. Um, it's a great way to separate UI from all your presentation logic to separate you know, for that from your services. Um, there's a great talk on MVVM, I believe, on Friday um, that you should definitely attend. It's going to Hulu's there, and they're going to show how they structure their application to work between Windows and Windows Phone and how they got such great code reviews using this model. So my home view is backed up by the very vague, mysteriously named home view model. And so we just want a new property that can say, should I show the text or not? So you don't have to watch me type everything. Now, that seems like a lot of code for those that might not know what a, um, what a, what notify property change is. Um, but all I'm doing is I'm getting a value, I'm setting it. If the value gets set, then I'm going to go off and tell the whole system, hey, I was changed. If you're hooked up to me, you should react to me and do something. So I had a new property here on my view model called empty list text visibility. So that's great, but it doesn't do anything yet. Nothing's actually hooked up to it. So we want, whenever the favorites get updated, and that's the thing that's bound on that home screen, whenever it gets updated, we want that to you know, call some code to change this, this value here. So the simplest way is you just hook this collection changed. Collection changed, we add a new method. And it's going to be called favorites collection change. Not all that difficult. And we have that coded up already. Just add that right here. Is that hard to see? I just realized. Is that any better? OK. Um, it's pretty simple. Uh, whenever it changes, um, since the list itself is changing given the event, that will be what the sender is, because the sender sent it. Um, the sender is usually, you know, say, an observable collection, but can also be a list. It could be something custom you created. But the very minimum, it's probably an iEnumerable, which is sort of one of the more, most basic interfaces for collections to support. So I'm going to assume the lowest common denominator, which is an iEnumerable. And then from an enumerator, or for, you want to get its enumerator, the thing that actually iterates over the collection. So I'm going to get that from it. And I'm just going to try to move one. I'm going to move forward one in this list. And if I can get at least to one, good. I know I have something in there. If I have something in there, if move next returns true, then I'm going to say, hey, the empty list, you should collapse it. You should hide it, because there's something in there. If it returns false, that means it's empty, and I want to show the empty list, the empty text. And here I just set it to either visible or collapsed. So that's on the code side, but now we just need to hook it up. So let's go on over to our home view, to our text. Again, so I'm not burning up people's eyeballs. And so we want to on the visibility. We're going to say static resource, or sorry, binding, because we want to bind to our view model. And let's see, empty list text visibility. I am personally a horrible speller, so some of the properties in my code are they're very hard to look for when, you, when you've spelled something wrong, to say that. So all that's hooked up and wired together. Give it a run. And as you can, I have no text. That's good. But does it actually work, or am I just lying to you guys? So since I didn't actually build the remove feature, <laughs> we're going to come over here and just clean the solution, which pulls it off the emulator. Run it again. Well, that's not good. I think it's lying. Because there it is. It actually works. So again, you can see we actually have our text. When I add a little bit of code, click Add, text goes away. So it's a convenient little thing to add to your applications to give it, again, that last little bit of polish. 
It's almost so easy that we often don't talk about it or publish many articles on it, but so you can grab it from this talk and, and inject it wherever you have a list. So those are just some, you know, like I say, go through and uh, check out that, the article on long list selector. Um, but another big thing is text, obviously. Text is a huge part of Windows Phone. Um, it's also something that people do a lot with on your phone. You interact with it. Um, again, some little pieces of guidance on working these controls is if you have a data entry screen, make sure you set focus automatically to the first text box in that screen. If people are 90% of the time always going to be tapping that anyways, help them out and set focus. Once you've set focus and if you have multiple text boxes and they hit return, please advance to the next one and that way they can continue editing their text. Um, a problem that I've seen in a few apps, again, not your guys' apps, <laughs> other people's apps, is there'll, there'll be three text boxes. And they'll type out their name and hit return on the first one, and it'll navigate them away from the page as if they signed up or as if they took the, the primary action on that page. Uh, and it's because they haven't trapped the enter key to go to the next text box. So I'll quickly show you how to do that. Another thing is input scopes. Uh, anyone know what input scopes are? I know a few of you do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyways, that's what controls how the layout of the keyboard. Please use them. If you're using if you, like an entry field that takes a, a web address, use the input scope URL. If it takes something for like a chat type of scenario, use the word chat. It'll get the cool emoji down there in the keyboard. Um, if it's long form text, use, use text. But please set it because it makes inter text entry that much easier. Make text friendly. Um, a big thing that we do with Windows Phone is we always go through and try to make the text not just useful but friendly. You want the device to feel like it, it's personable. Um, I've seen some very robotic type of text out there. So if you can try to do something to make your apps you want to feel more friendly to people, you know, make it have a conversation with the user. Um, and use accent color sparingly. Accent color is usually reserved for things that take an action. If you tap on it, it's going to do something. If you look at all the buttons and all the controls in the system, um, as soon as you press on them, they turn to the accent color. Anything that has an accent color on it is almost always something you can action on. And if you're in like a list, usually the thing that's the accent color is the most important part of that item. So this accent color is one of those things that don't just splash it everywhere, you know, be conscious of how you use it. Uh, and lastly, one of the things that I also see in edit boxes or in entry pages is there will be controls that are evenly spaced from each other. This includes the text that sits above them will be evenly spaced from the, te from the text box below it, and then that from the text underneath it. So you almost don't know which one goes with what. So tighten up and loosen your spacing so the headers that may sit above your text box sit a little bit closer to it. Um, I'm just going to show you some quick code on, on text. So let's go to an actual entry screen. Over here it's called pin it. Pin it. There we go. Basic entry screen. So the first thing I said was um, let's make sure we set focus. Easiest way to do that is just hook the loaded event. Once it's loaded, navigate to the first text box. Now if you use MVVM, you're probably screaming because I'm actually now in the code behind file and you're like, why are you doing that? There are easier ways and other ways to automatically hook the visual tree and you go and you find the first text box and you set it and you can do these multiple ways. But for a, a clear explanation of how to, you know, what you should do, I'm doing it this way. So do, as soon as I've done this, as soon as I go to the pin page, it's, the first text box will automatically have focus. So that's a good start. So what about advancing to the next pages? That is easy enough. All you have to do, oh, I'm sorry, guys. All you have to do is hook the key down events. And on the key down, you just look at the key that comes in. Is it enter? Sweet. Go on to the next, the next control. Very easy to do. Again, if you're MVVM purist, you are also cringing, and there's other ways to, to address this. So let's actually make sure we hook those key events up. So come over here to text block. Just say key down. And we're in the URL one, so we'll just say URL. Oh, that's not going to work, is it? It's a text block. You want it in the box. 
go over here to this box, key down. And now when I hit enter in these two different text boxes, they'll auto advance to the next one. And I'll show you how that actually works. Um, then I also talked about input scope. How do you set those? Is that very difficult? Not at all. You say input scope. Now here you have no IntelliSense. So you don't have any idea what's available to you. So this is another instance where blend comes to your rescue. We switch over to blend. We go find this particular view that we're working with, pin it. Click on the text box. Go over to properties. Scroll on down. Input scope. And here they are. This is a good way to see what's available to the user. Um, this is look, a URL, so I'm going to put that in there. Um, for title, oh, that's just basic text, so I'll use text. And for description, I'm going to, you know, maybe they'll do some uh, longer type of chat things in there. So I can scroll on up to chat. Save it. I can come back over to Visual Studio, let it refresh, and you can see it's now put input scopes in for me. So we're close, we're close, but some, some formatting. You know, how do I make these look a little bit better, a little more tightly grouped with each other? So what we can do that for that is we can just add a style. A very simple style. Come up here. For this one, I'm just going to add it at the page level. Now, again, because I am using MVVM, my root page tends to be a thing called view base, not phone application page. Normally, if you weren't using MVVM, you see something like um, phone application page. And since I'm actually putting this in the resources, grab this, paste that, grab the style, and again, I can save it. And I find it's much faster to apply styles over here. Right click, edit style, apply resource. And here's mine right up here. As you can see, it turns it, it brings in the padding a little bit so it sits a little tighter and it changes it to more of a subtle color to be consistent with the rest of Windows Phone. Do that. Same thing over here. And now it's starting to look a little bit better. Now, one other tip and trick that no one, we don't really talk about, um, internally, there's controls called spacer controls. Um, this is a convenient way to lay out and, and position controls rel relative to each other without having to adjust individual margins and padding. And we don't have a spacer control. It's so easy that you don't actually need one. Uh, so instead, we just sort of fake it. So I want to get some, you know, a little bit more space in between each of these groups of edit boxes. So I'm going to do is I'm just going to use a border. And I'm going to give it a height of 10. And you can see it pushed it down a little bit. And it seems sort of like a hack, um, but it's actually a very convenient way to add some spacing in between groups really quickly. I'm just going to duplicate that here. Push that down as well. Give it a quick run. And all these things are fascinating to me because the more I work with the design studio, the more I work with the people that build the first party experiences, I realize there's a bunch of knowledge that we're, we haven't yet fully shared to, to the developers. Um, because developers struggle with how do I make the UI look exactly like you do? What are these magical numbers? We have these numbers. And uh, one of the things that I'm really pushing for is to create a design guide that has concrete values for you to consume and use without having to take screenshots and do pixel comparisons, which is something I've done multiple times before I'm like, hey, can you guys just tell me what the numbers are? It's like, yes, we would love to tell you. Can you please give it to developers? So um, when I put the source up for this talk, hopefully I'll have all those values up there for you as well, included in the source. Click on me, click add, and as you can see, my first text box here has focus. The reason you don't see the SIP is because I hit it. So I'm typing, but we'll try that again. There you go. SIP is up. I'm ready to start rocking. As you can see, I have a .com in my SIP. That's because I use the URL namespace. And when I hit the sort of the next button, 
it auto advances to the correct place. I hit next, again, advances to the next place. Much more usable experience. So that's just some tips and tricks on text right there. Customizing. Now, if you want to customize something and really change it around, um, you want to re-template it. And re-templating is just taking the visuals of a control and changing them for something else. Um, the whole model in XAML, whether it's Windows or Windows Phone, is there's only actually very key parts in a control that display your data or do something. Everything around it's just Chrome. You can add new borders, you can add images, you can add all sorts of stuff that's not key to actually functioning and working. Um, so I can take one minute to show you how to re-template hyperlink to be something a little more useful and to look a little more like the phone. So we'll come on over here. And let's go to the pin view. Here's a hyperlink. Um, it's underlined, and often in Windows you don't really see an underline. You see it more the accent color. So we're just going to right click, edit the template. You can, we're going to edit a copy. We're just going to call this accent hyperlink style. And don't be scared by the massive amount of XAML that just popped up. Or by the fact that it's really tiny. Oh. There we go. Now let's sort of do some rearranging over here. Actually, we'll go all source. So the only thing that's actually important here to make this control work is right here this text block. Everything else is superficial. You can change it. You can add another border in here. You could add a hard code an image in there. You can do all sorts of crazy stuff. But that's what gives controls the power. That's why when you're writing an application that maybe targets Windows and Windows Phone, you can have two different templates, one that looks maybe more phone, one that looks more Windows. Yet the underlying code is the same. And so templating is a very powerful topic. Um, I encourage you, if you want to you know, learn more about how to make your controls really look different, learn more about templating, because it's, it's a very vast topic. Um, but for this, this case here, I want to actually just change it to remove the underline, and I want to have an accent. I want to make it use the accent color. So to do that, I'm just going to look through this text block here. Like, horizontal alignment, yeah, I want it to flow through. That's fine. The text, I definitely want that to stay, you know, whatever it is. Underline, that may be a good hint that that's the thing I want to get rid of. If I pop back over to this view, oh, that's <laughs> sneaky on the other side now. But um, it's not underlined. We're almost there. What about accent color? I can do the same thing. I can say foreground, static resource, and say phone, accent, brush. And now it's changed. And so now I've retemplated this control. This control doesn't have any property on it to set um, whether or not it should underline or not. So I had to reach into its internals and strip out the underline. But you saw it was very easy, and I did it in under a minute with all my you know, random talking around it. I only have two minutes left, so I'll just briefly go over this. But user controls are a great way to sort of take a bunch of different controls and repackage them into a simple, like, reusable component. For example, here I'm taking the big 52 as, uh, that we saw in my interface before, and the little text underneath it that said pins or whatever it says. I'm like, you know what? I use this all over my application. I'm tired of relaying it out and having to you know, think of different ways to, to code it up. It's the same thing. It's really just two text blocks sitting on top of each other. So you can take those two controls and merge them together to create one new control, like say the Pinterest text block. And then you only have to work with one control, and you can use it as one unit everywhere. If you use Photoshop, it's like grouping, or any drawing program, it's like grouping as well. Um, it's a great way to make your apps consistent. Uh, last, last slide before you just get to the, the, the closing credits. If you have ads in your application, try to push them to the top versus the bottom. Uh, if people start getting accidentally tapping on your ad, it seems great at first, free ad impressions, right? Until the user gets very, very angry. <laughs> um, and an angry user stops using the application. Um, I know we haven't done a great you know, guidance on where to put your ad, and we want to improve that, maybe make, make a template for that. But until then, put your ads up top if you can. Um, and for anyone making games targeted at children, 
try not to use blinking ads because kids think that's the most wonderful and awesome part of the game ever. And so they tap on the ad, they go out of the, the application, and now they don't know how to get back. And they're like, eh, I, don't, I don't like that game anymore. And they stop playing it. Again, so you might get an initial one-click spike, and then people sort of stop using it. So ads up top, and try not to make them flash and blink if they're for kids. Get back in proper presentation mode here. So there's just a big eye chart, and it's going to actually grow. I'm going to add more and more to this um, when, the, when the slides go live. But yeah, just a quick list to go through all these little things I did. They're very easy to do. They're also very easy to forget. So just something to run through. Some great resources. Again, the phone SDK is not too hard to find. Um, Blend comes with it. So again, that's very easy. But Blend is a great tool. I know a lot of people don't use it because they don't understand it or they don't know what its value is. But when it comes to visually making your apps look really great, it's a great tool for that. Um, and the Windows Phone Toolkit, near and dear to my heart. It's how I started at Microsoft, was working on the toolkit. So I happen to love it quite a bit. I make active code contributions to it and check in bug fixes. Some other great talks to go to. Um, if you guys didn't see Karina's talk earlier today, I recommend watching it online. Um, she goes into a lot of design stuff. Um, she has a design vision that I definitely don't have. Um, Thomas is going to have a great talk on live tiles. Um, again, you know all the great news we heard about Windows today, you want to be able, how do you leverage both? How do you leverage what you're learning to target both these plat platforms? Definitely go to the, the building for both talk. I um, mean, again, like on Friday, there's a great MVVM talk with Hulu. And thank you. Thank you very much, guys.